Let me first introduce uh, our, our panelists here this morning. Um, we've got Richard Izak from Alcatel Lucent, Alan Percy from Audio Codes, Doug Tate from Oracle, and Philippe Sultan from 3R Load. 3 Reload, okay. Uh, so here, what I'd like to do first, before we get into the questions, is I'd like to give you guys a minute to introduce yourselves, and, um, and then uh, Dean and I'll start in on you. So have at it. Let's, give me two minutes. Should I start here? Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Douglas Tate. I'm the product marketing manager for our service delivery platforms within Oracle. Um, I've been asked many times, what the heck is Oracle doing here? Yeah, we're a great database company, and we're a great enterprise and IT-based company. We are moving very rapidly in the communications space. We've been focused on communications for the past eight years, especially around OSS, BSS systems, now around service delivery, and WebRTC is just a natural extension to what we've been doing. Thanks. Oh, there you are. Hi. My name is Richard Azak. I work for Alcatel Lucent uh, in uh, corporate standards. Uh, we're very interested in the topic, uh, obviously, and in particular, uh, uh, inner working of WebRTC with IMS networks, and that's that's an area that I'm particularly focusing on. But we have a lot of other uh, interests in the technology, and uh, this has been a great event. And I hope you enjoy the the hour. Hope so. Okay. My name is Philippe Sultan. I am the CTO of uh, Reload, and uh, Reload is a small startup company, and we are a telco company that provides an API so that uh, people can um, um, uh, develop applications so that they route their calls and handle their SIP accounts and, uh, and uh, voicemail boxes, etc. This is for all enterprise telephony. And uh, we also provide a uh, JavaScript uh, API to, in order to handle the, the web RTC stuff. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alan Percy. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing for Audio Codes. Uh, and if I think a lot of you folks probably know us from our uh, media gateways and session border controllers. Uh, one of the key things we bring to the market is our uh, underpinnings, basically hardware underpinnings that help enable applications. So we have a, a broad, diverse uh, community of application developers, including Genesis, for example, Microsoft, uh, and many, many others, who've built SIP-based or software applications uh, and need to be able to integrate them into either legacy systems like uh, TDM PBXs or the legacy TDM network uh, through gateways or integrate them in with other SIP services, for example, SIP trunking or integrate dissimilar SIP systems together uh, using our session border controllers. So we've been deeply involved in, in SIP solutions for quite a long time uh, and we're here talking about how we're going to help our SIP, our, our long-term SIP uh, relationship uh, developers move to a WebRTC enabled environment uh, and have had long discussions with them about how we're going to make that happen. So uh, we did a couple of announcements this week. We, did, uh, we announced on Monday that uh, we've added the Opus codec to our IP phones uh, and also a roadmap towards our uh, session border controllers uh, to WebRTC enable them. So I'm glad to be here and glad you folks are spending some time with us. Okay, right. so Dean, I'm going to let you kick off the, uh, the questioning and in not, no specific order, here's some of our topics. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Dean Bubbly from Disrupt Analysis, and uh, I've been following WebRTC for two years. And one of the topics which um, comes up again and again is around signaling um, for WebRTC applications and whether it was A, right to not to include signaling to begin with, and B, um, whether SIP is going to end up being the, the signaling mechanism of choice. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to sort of go through my views on this, but th there's a couple of thoughts that, I, that or questions that I've got to the panel around this. And the first one is, is there anything you can do with SIP that you can't front end with WebRTC? Is, so it's, uh, is, is sort of WebRT, is SIP enable WebRTC a subset or a super, or is, is WebRTC a subset or a superset of SIP? Which way around? Well, right, right from the bat, uh, subset, WebRTC is, is a subset of SIP. And if you look at the API, you go to the JavaScript, you can see the call flow that is so similar to the invite register call flow that you see in the SIP world. So there's no question in my mind it's a subset. And to that point in the W3C and, and, and the HTML5, it's tried to make this as simple and easy to use as possible. 
Right, but I'm thinking, are there things that you can do with other SIP platforms, like a typical UC system or an IMS, that cannot be done with WebRTC involved at all? I might offer up that the, that the data channel and media handling capabilities of WebRTC are obviously significant enhancements of, above over what SIP can do. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the things our, our developer community is probably looking at uh, as a challenge, is how do I enable those data channels and those, the media capability, um, but still leveraging the SIP platform that we've already invested in. Uh, so I probably would say, you know, some areas WebRTC clearly has greater capabilities, um, and admittedly it will be constrained initially with some of the limitations of SIP, um, but um, you know, it's a platform, I think, you know, it's, uh, it, it's an evolutionary process, right? We're going to have to move from one to, the, uh, to enable the other. Richard. Uh, I'm not sure that they're equivalent uh, in the sense that SIP is a rendezvous protocol, and it can be used in, in, in many systems, and it, it serves its purpose very well. And WebRTC is, uh, is, is a framework that can use more than that. You can, you can in, uh, integrate a number of web functions and, and, and leverage the fact that SIP is available in order to rendezvous users, but that they're not equivalent. Oh, and you, I, I recognize that, but, I, so, but, I, but I'm trying to work out what are the WebRTC use cases for which SIP is either useful, mandatory, um, helpful, or unhelpful, and trying to almost like categorize things that way. Okay, the, uh, let me just start with the obvious one, which is uh, uh, interconnect with, with most of the existing network today. Uh, SIP is clearly the dominant a signaling protocol f to enable that, and most applications require that capability. So I'm mean, obviously, it, uh, when you get into over-the-top players and other kinds of applications, you have, and, and, and some of the other ways of interconnecting that we've seen here at various demo tables, uh, SIP becomes optional, not necessary in a sense, but, but are those use cases the dominant ones? And that's, that's the, yeah, That's a trick, a trick question. question. Yeah. I, can't, I don't have an yeah. immediate answer to that, but it's, uh, it's an interesting question. Philippe. <clears throat> well, I, I can speak about um, from a developer perspective because uh, I'm developing web applications and I'm a SIP engineer as well. And uh, I, I, have, I can say I have a use case where I, find it, I found it to be that SIP could be an obstacle for some things. Uh, for instance, we developed, uh, our, we developed our own conferencing module, audio conferencing module, on top of open source softwares. Okay, we did that, and we, we wanted to bring it to the, to, to the WebRTC side. It is already available from the PSTN. You only have to call a number, wait for an IVR, etc., etc. Then you're in a conference room. We wanted that to be available in the web browser using WebRTC. So what we did is. We said, OK, we are using open source software. Can we use SIP in order to do that? Yes, we can. There, is many, there are many now uh, JavaScript stacks that are, that are available, that are open source, that you can use, that are very well documented. So that's fine. But we wanted to get everything we could get from, the, from this conferencing engine, so that we wanted to know when someone comes into the conference room, when someone leaves, and even when someone is talking in the conference room. So these events should have been passed over SIP if we wanted to, to, to have them um, uh, seen on the web browser side. And SIP could have been an obstacle in, that, in, in the way that we, we only do WebSocket for that, so it's very light. So, so, so in other words, for certain functions like, I don't know, audio level or something like that, you probably needed to have something else to signal that rather than SIP. So you could use SIP to set something up, but capabilities inside the session is probably something else. Right. And actually, we don't use SIP at all, even for setting up the session and bridging the, the session with the PSTN. You know, what's interesting, though, is that a lot, a lot of the, you know, SIP has the ability of you know, proprietary extensions built into it, so a lot of the facilities probably could have been implemented with SIP. Now, I can easily see situations where an application might 
uh, not envision being connected to any other communication system. It might be a closed ecosystem. Gaming, for example, you know, we saw some examples this morning. I could easily uh, envision a situation where someone would build an application and say, you know what, I'm, I'm very unlikely I'm going to be connected to any enterprise network or any of the public networks. Uh, it's a closed system. I don't need all that, uh, the weight of SIP, so I'm going to use a proprietary mechanism. It makes perfect sense. Right, so I, I'm going to kind of extend this a little bit. Um, what, you know, we, the misnomer, if you will, of a SIP trunk, that aggregation point is really kind of a, my perspective. Do you see any of your carrier customers looking t in their product strategy to deliver maybe a WebRTC trunk? No? I see some complex Not at all faces. For me. <laughs> No, 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 they're completely different spaces for me. You know, you know. Well, in the, by nature, if you look at the nature of, of, uh, of both technologies, you have a web browser technology, which is WebRTC. Mm -hmm. And we, you have, uh, well, SIP is a session initiation. It is a protocol. So it's not, it's, it, ha it doesn't have anything to do with a web browser, for instance. Mm -hmm. So to me, they, they, they are very separated. And I want, uh, I think it, we, we could not uh, build SIP trunks with a uh, with, uh, web artist. Mm -hmm. Philippe, it might help if you, if you point the microphone towards you. Oh, it's, it's probably... Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, what I can see, by the way, it, first of all, just clarification, right? So a SIP trunk is, is, uh, is actually an application, and the application is, is using SIP to communicate to somebody out in the public network, mm -hmm. right? So if you, if you step back and say, all right, could I build an application that would allow me to use a browser to reach somebody in the public network? Yes, you could, very easily. So from a strict answer of could you build an application to allow, yes, you could. Would it make sense? Now then that becomes a little bit muddier. So okay, well, why do we have SIP trunks? Well, the reason we have SIP trunks is because we have legacy vision of the world that need to be able to reach the public network. It's conferencing systems, it's PBXs, et cetera. Uh, and they need a mechanism to be able to reach out to the PSTN or allow the PSTN to access into the, in the application. And right now, a SIP is an excellent way to do that uh, w w it's not quite clear that we need WebRTC uh, to do that. Co uh, not quite right. a normal And, and it just ties into that question about bypassing, inter you know, uh, certain services. So, well, well, well there's there's another aspect, which is that WebRTC doesn't define signaling. Mm -hmm. It it can't. I mean, there, the, the notion of a WebRTC trunk is. I mean. It, 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 no such thing exists. You have to have some signaling protocol, mm -hmm. uh, whether it uh, whether it be SIP. Or, and, and there, there is discussion of various alternatives to its use from the, uh, from the browser mm -hmm. to the access node, whatever it is. Right. But uh, again, WebRTC is not equivalent in that sense. What are what the, the arguments for and against extending SIP down to the browser with, say, um, WebSockets versus doing something where you extend SIP only as far as the gateway and then you use an API. I mean, what, what are the scenarios where you'd pick one or other of those, even though it is perhaps connecting to a, a legacy application? I, I think there's a, a lot of area of discussion here. The one area which I, I like to look at is just the basic ergonomics that we see a browser and the way we see our communications. So bringing, bringing um, SIP down to the browser point, um, I would say it's, it's, it would change just the same way we went from PSTN fixed line to wireless. All of a sudden, the wireless were missing calls or, or calls are going out roaming. Unfortunately, the wireless, wireless industry caught up and, and had better coverage, but still, I, my, my boss will go out of range and he'll tell me, oh, I'm going out of range and we missed the call. Well, I think it, we'll see far worse things on the browser side in that I have 20 screens up at once. A lot of it depends on what my laptop's doing. And then I'm popping between the screens and, oh, I'm, I'm doing a call at the same time. Same, de same deal on a mobile device where you've got maybe multiple apps running. I, I, my, my sense is that SIP on the device is a bit of a clunky fit with multitasking. Yeah, yeah, and also I, I could I could lose or, you know, things happen on the browser where I lose the connection and I come back and or I expect delays. Am I going to get that same kind of quality of service with SIP? Go ahead. I I consider this almost a religious issue, because look, <laughs> there are lots of ways to to to, to cut this. Hmm. Uh, SIP over WebSockets perfectly functional. It may require a little bit more uh, code on the browser to run the, the, the protocol stack, but, uh, or, or a uh, REST API cert that certainly can function, but then you have to decide what your communications primitives are 
Right. Uh, and there are other alternatives also discussed. I, 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 I don't, I see them as roughly equivalent, and some people feel very, relig some religious fervor about uh, it. Yeah. But I, I, I'm <laughs> thinking, I'm thinking more of like a real world scenario, and I say on a mobile device, particularly on a mobile device where WebRTC itself may not be enabled just by the browser, but why one of the dozen or so API and cloud providers we've got outside. And so we may well have a situation where I've got a taxi booking app, which has got uh, a sort of click to speak in it. I've got the op my, my service provider's um, uh, sort of web phone. I've got something in a browser window. And I've got, I don't know, I'm doing karaoke at the same time. Yeah, the, 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 the scenario is that there, I'm doing karaoke until I get a phone call or the taxi company connects. How, how, in that situation, do I end up with four separate SIP stacks running on my phone inside the application, the browser or the OS, and trying to coordinate all that on the network side? I think you, you, you can have, go back, going back to your question about having WebRTC completely enabled in the web browser, uh, SIP in the, in the web browser. I think SIP brings some interesting feature for, for, for the end user. The first one being registration, okay? You want to be called uh, how to do it with WebRTC. You do it with WebRTC web by, for, ex for example, sharing a web URL where, where to, to, your, to, the, to your neighbors and say, okay, you want to call me? You, you click that, you, you, you place that URL, and we can talk. And you can register with SIP. That's a, that's a feature that, uh, that it brings to WebRTC. So you, you enter your login password, and then you are registered, and someone can call you on your, on your web browser. Right. And you also identify yourself. So it brings identity management as well. OK, I know. You can do many ways. You can manage the identity in many other ways, either proprietary or using XMPP. But I think that bringing registration for the end user is kind of a nice feature of SIP. And just a quick follow-up on your question, if I may. Uh, I, I don't see it as a problem uh, moving between devices or the kind of scenario you described. I mean, you, you, you have a stack. You may run multiple instances of it. I mean, that's, that's not rocket science. I, I just don't, I don't see that as an issue. I just wanted to respond to that particular point. Other than that, you, st you have to have some way of communicating the state changes that, uh, for a communication session. SIP was defined to do that. You can create any alternative you want, uh, but then you have to define how to interwork it with, uh, with SIP or other signaling protocols anyway. So that, That's the rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> that's the hard part. Right. It, uh, using SIP is not the hard part, so I, I'm done. Well, I, I, I see that. I'm sorry. I'll make it quick. Um, I see WebRTC is that final solution for SIP for the last mile, you know. In that, I've I've done a lot of SIP programming or development on my laptop, and I just get tangled up all the time. And, and when it comes down to that last mile, that presentation layer, I want something simple, clean, concise, and someone that that they can control on the web server side, not that I need to control on my client side. Yeah. So uh, just. Uh, uh, Quick thoughts so to answer your question about the mobility, multiple applications. You know, certainly SIP has the ability of putting you know a, a media stream on hold, basically. You know, to pause a media stream, uh, put a call on hold, those kinds of things. And I would envision probably mobile apps. If you switch from one active app to another, you'll probably put the others uh, in a hold state, and it would have separate SIP sessions to handle that. And that certainly is within the protocol capability. I, I think an area that um, is worth exploring is sort of the discussion of. Andrew, so mean you've never had a web conference where you simultaneously had a say a, sit, a Skype messaging chat um, as a back channel to your colleagues. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now I'm just talking about the mobile environment, which which you know you may decide, for example, for that particular application, you would like to keep the media stream going in the background versus in the foreground. But different apps might not. A game, for example, you might by default pause the game or pause the media stream, or watching a movie, you know, if you put it in the background. So it'll depend on the application, and the application will have the ability, through SIP, to put the media stream on hold, or to pause it. Um, an area I think that's sort of interesting to explore that is, um, is, is going to be sort of a bit of an issue for the application developers, and I see, you know, I sit with our application developers, and they're sort of all scratching their head at this point, saying, okay, well, you know, how do we migrate or enable WebRTC is going to be the interoperability issue. And this is um, a pretty scary place if you're an app developer right now. You know, um, 
if you pick one browser and you pick one version of the browser, you probably can get it to work, and I think we've just seen eight hours of that, right? <laughs> uh, what happens when there's six browsers and four different versions of each, and you're an app developer and you have to support those? Um, it's kind of, you know, that's kind of scary. So I think that narrowing what we do for signaling uh, as an industry, I think, is going to help the application developers tremendously. And some, what I would set as a goal for the, for the, you know, the folks here in this room is in the next six months before we get together again in San Francisco, is let's nail down a, uh, a mechanism for traditional applications to communicate into the multi-billion dollar investment in SIP that's just happened over the last decade. So that at least these WebRTC applications can come up and inter integrate in uh, to that investment that's already been made then we can go from there. So maybe it's sort of a call to action for the group. I mean, there's an interesting point there, and as a slide, I don't know if you're in the, the business session I did the other day, where there's a bit of a philosophical battle in my mind for the soul of WebRTC. Is it about adding web to existing forms of RTC, or is it about adding RTC to existing forms of the web? Uh, and, uh, yeah, and I think the two have got quite different approaches to that. So if I was eBay and I wanted to add something to negotiate between buyer and seller, I wouldn't necessarily, there's no legacy there. Or, or if I'm a game developer or something like that. Whereas if I'm a UC or a video conferencing uh, company or a telecom core network uh, engineer, I, I've, I'm coming from the other direction. <clears throat> so let's go, let's go back to the, the bypass discussion, because you guys are, you deal with carriers on a regular basis. Is, are they completely, you know, are they wedded to sticking with SIP or are there other bypass mechanisms that they're envisioning that they're asking you to help support? Wow. Got it. <laughs> uh, at, at this point, uh, SIP is the dominant mechanism mm -hmm. that, that service providers have spent a lot of money on. Yeah. Uh, it would take something dramatic to get them to uh, let go of that. Now. That's not to say that they might offer services that are WebRTC enabled. And a good example, that would be what Vonage has done with their mobile client. Mm -hmm. That's an enhancement of what they've done with their SIP network, but not a replacement for it. So I think that's probably what you're going to see is more of that. Or, or does your new carrier become your ISP? Hmm. Well, I think you know, then there's a whole discussion of the smart pipe, dumb pipe, dumb right. pipe you know, who right. provides the application. Yeah. Uh, but let it be said, you know, some of the service providers are going to end up being dumb pipes, and it's just going to they're offer SIP trunks or and they use SIP inside the core of their network. Others are going to be more aggressive and offer, you know, take your mobile no take your number to your tablet or take your number to your mobile phone or, or other services yeah. like that. I, I mean, I, I personally don't think the dumb pipe discussion is helpful because what actually you are increasingly finding is service providers setting up. Um, digital applications units which are decoupled from the network. So they have a, a networking unit and they have a services and application team. Telefonica and Telefonica Digital is the most obvious, but Telenor and Singtel and Telstra and a bunch of others are doing that as well. Um, start thinking about questions. We're going to throw it up to the floor, I think, at some point. If I may, on the, on the last topic. Um, this gets down to the, 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 the model, the basic model here. Do we interconnect between operators, or do users just uh, rendezvous at a, at a common uh, server, uh, or through, a, through some OTT, through some other fabric, interconnect fabric? Uh, so is it interconnect, or is it island? And, and yes, they are both valid ways of, of establishing communications. But I think it's true that for interconnect, if you use that model, if you assume that each party wants to use their own operator because well, they, they want to have a way of, of uh, accessing QoS because they want other services associated with, that they're, only their operator can provide them. Uh, there, there, are, there are reasons why each party might want to use their own operator and, and, uh, or, or an enterprise, for example. It seems unlikely that an enterprise is going to want to routinely use, uh, you know, other party servers for communication. I mean, they, they may. I mean, it's 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 a debatable topic, but I can see many cases where enterprises are going to want to have some control over that. So, uh, for interconnect, I think SIP is pretty dominant. There are other options, but in terms of actual inter, inter exchange, uh, SIP seems to be the only way to go. 
but if you want for, for these for these island models, those are going to exist. I, I don't know how dominant they're going to be. There's, it's certainly going to be out there, and there are many use cases that for which that island that island model is attractive. Mm -hmm. But it's it's an interesting dichotomy. Right. I think we, you make you make a good point there, and and the. Uh, I think the assumption you're making is that it, you know we all know WebRTC is a peer-to-peer -peer mm -hmm. and and browser to browser, and so to bypass you're assuming that all the clients out there will be browser-based, mm -hmm. and so I think the point you make on interconnect is, is is real valid, in that well I'm not constantly on my browser I'm usually on my cell phone or I'm tiling in. Now I could see for an enterprise approach to you know uh, where, where where call centers or for finance or where they all agree on here's the website here's the browsers mm -hmm. point to that and that's how we all enter work yeah that's there's no question there will be an industry move, moves that direction but for everyone else who has phones browsers you still have to have that interconnect mm -hmm. yeah so but, i would say it's bypassing but, but you, anytime you bought, soon. Acme, you bought acme packets so surely it's a good idea if everyone uses a whole plethora of signaling channels because there's going to be you know signaling a b c d z right. uh, to sip gateway requirements yes yep <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, should we, Chris? Do you got anything else, or should we open it up to the floor? I'm sorry. Should we? Should we open it up to the floor? How, how long? How long have we got on this? We've got till uh, we've got 20 minutes. Excellent. We got plenty right. of time. Um, hugely bright lights up here. Any any takers for questions? Raise your hands. Uh, now or forever so, so I'll ask the first one then to try to get the, the crowd primed, if that's okay, Dean. Um, my question is, can we talk about, with the carriers kind of going to adopt WebRTC, everybody who I've talked to at the show who's building apps are in effect over the top. And my question for you guys is, as they're going to be in effect an island within the carriers of Android phones that will be fully integrated and everything else will have to be over the top. That's a good question. You follow that logic, guys? Because of the fact that with H240, 264 and WebRT and uh, VP8, we're going to end up in two different strategies. No one want to take that on. I asked the a bombshell, and nobody wants to deal with it, huh? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, I, I, the, uh, the relevance there is that yeah, and, Android Android devices are more customizable, particularly when sold through an operator channel. Um, I mean, globally, it's probably only about mm, forty percent of phones are sold through operator channels, but in North America, it's much higher. Um, if you take the assumption that Apple is unlikely to have a full spec IMS client on the phone and the other operating systems are comparatively small, do we end up with you know, Android operator IMS stack full, full blown and it, then other stuff? Uh, so I was going to take a stab at Carl's question, maybe that offer up another little piece uh, of the puzzle. So give it maybe an example of it would be uh, Apple's FaceTime. All right, so that's a closed uh, environment, uh, you know, between two Apple uh, handheld devices that can communicate versus Skype. And Skype, uh, similar functionality, right? Video, audio conferencing, but it's available on many, many other endpoints. And, and it just it, one of the things, it gives Apple, you know, greater control of the application. I can see, you know, I, it's you know, built in automatically into the, uh, into the handheld device. There's probably some licensing issues that it solves for them. But no toys about it, it only allows Apple users to reach some, what, 50% of the marketplace of mobile handsets where, you know, the Skype application obviously be having, you know, much broader applicability. So I think the application developers need to be cognizant of the fact that the widest audience that they can possibly reach uh, needs to be their target to make sure that they don't silo themselves uh, unless it's deliberate. So, uh, right? well, unless it's deliberate. <laughs> and this, uh, and the interesting question there is, is this silo, silo, siloing thing sometimes has its own, own value. So you know, it's almost like it, you interoperate when you think there's a business justification for it rather than auto as default. Yeah, and the, the one thing that the telecommunications industry is really good at is the agreements and the SLAs be between they have between all the companies, and they've done a remarkable job here. And you don't see Google talking to Yahoo, talking to Apple in that same level of thinking. So it becomes more of a business question, and and, and that interoperability has allowed us to call anyone in the world. But is that because Google and Yahoo and Co. can't, or because they don't want to? <laughs> 
They don't. Well, I believe they don't want to. I, again, so back to the business model. They, they want. Business they want to own. Where, whereas I think I think eventually the telecommunications companies understood for them to grow their business they had to do this allowing roaming and interoperability between all the networks and this is quite a remarkable thing when you think about it because you can call anyone in the world given a phone number where where are we going with WebRTC well now we're going down this island path and you have island of on Androids and islands on iPhone and that's not necessarily a good thing. I think it depends on the use case. I think there are use cases where the island model works fine. But my personal opinion is that they're, they're limited. Uh, if, if you're willing to, to rendezvous at a common server, to, to prearrange, I mean, and for custom applications, uh, it, it, it probably makes sense. But uh, for many others, uh, you really want to be able to use your, your own client, the one you're used to. You know how to, how to inv uh, invoke features. You know what you're getting. Uh, the security aspects are, are better understood, you're more comfortable with it. So for many users, I, I see a real advantage to, to being able to, to use their own client and therefore we need interop, uh, we need an interconnect. Uh, and, and, and it's really better for, I think, for end users if they have that option, if the networks are connected. The fact that ver there are various OTTs that, that you know, embrace the island model and because they want a closed uh, uh, community of users is, I don't, I don't know if that's a good thing for us or not. Okay. Um, there's, there's a couple so, of questions. There's a gentleman there and, and, yeah. and, some, uh, and, and then Jeff in the front. C could I ask? Hi. Hi, uh, Chris Went from Comcast. Uh, in the whole discussion about uh, SIP over WebSockets, I never heard any comments about the security. To me, bringing SIP into a web browser, JavaScript, you know, what is the hole there? Is the website, you know, login and SIP digest good enough for security? Or, you know, securing HTTP is a, is a lot more straightforward than uh, securing SIP. So do, do enterprises really want to expose SIP out to the web browser outside their, you know, LAN? Um, What's your opinion on that? Anyone want to take that? So, uh, uh, I'm not sure I understood correctly. It was about, you were about, you were afraid that the password can be passed in the clear over the WebSocket channel? So, because, right. if, because if so, uh, the, the, SIP, the SIP protocol doesn't allow that. You made hashes of, of the passwords so that you, you don't send, uh, of, you, you send them over the network in a secure way. No, I'm just saying is SIP Digest uh, um, um, good enough or, uh, you know, or is there other potential holes because you have full access to the SIP stack within the browser? Well, you, are, you have full, full access to the SIP stack and, and that's a good, a good point to my mind for, for security reasons because when you run um, a SIP client in a, in a web browser and you, and you ask the user to enter his login and password, the, the whole code is run in the web browser, so you have to make sure that uh, his logins, his credentials are, are, um, are kept secure. So, but on the, on the other hand, it, uh, it makes, it makes a, it's another point uh, to, to SIP, it's another good point to SIP to work with WebRTC because uh, when you work with, with SIP over WebRTC, you have identity management. So you, you know sure. who's calling, and also, you, you can charge after that your customer if he, if he, if he makes a call to the PSTN. Um, can I make a suggestion? We actually have a session this afternoon in the telco track on back office and security. Um, and uh, I suspect there's going to be a number of people in the room who are going to be more than happy to go into the, the specifics on that one. Um, so can I suggest we park that, that particular theme for now and come back to that? Um, I think it's at 3 o'clock, but I have to check the agenda. Uh, um, Jeff. Yeah, and I was trying to get a feel for this uh, yesterday as well. The, we're living in, I think we're living in a disruptive time. Uh, there is going to be change, and I think we see that economically in Europe with 13% decline on voice revenues, SMS is tanking, people are giving profit warnings in the traditional space. I think uh, the US carriers are, are very intelligent with manipulation of, uh, of you know, uh, uh, pricing models that have moved to data, uh, but but that kind of buys time. It's you know it's not a, a value-based move really. If if you were sat 
as advisors to traditional service providers that are providing traditional voice, what do you think they have to do? What would you recommend that they have to change and do to make sure that they, they take advantage of the growth ahead? I could add to that sure. is just to um, considering uh, there's always an ROI discussion but right now we've got Vonage with a with a stake in the ground are there competitive reactions to that at this point that dovetail with this discussion well I'm sure there's probably competitive reactions to it that just may not be visible right but okay. but I think to your point uh, and we discussed it earlier I think that the service providers um, that there's an opportunity and they've missed an opportunity, but one of the opportunities that the service providers have is that they are the last mile for connectivity for enterprises and for consumers. And, and they also have uh, an asset that sometimes is not recognized as they're one of the few people that you write a check to every month reliably. And they have financial engines behind them. And for the service providers, um, I think that they They've maybe missed an opportunity to become part of the billing side of the web, uh, which was unfortunate. You know, if, if, the, if your Google wallet was really your Verizon wallet and you already have to pay with Verizon and you can pay for all your, your, what, your online services uh, through one bill, I think that, you know, that would have been an opportunity that was missed. That being said, I think that the service providers have tried to be their own application stores. You know, uh, the, you know, the iPhones and Verizons and others like that have tried to build their own applications and quickly they were dwarfed by the applications available uh, on the open market. So they've discovered uh, that their ecosystem is not what they thought. They thought that they were gonna be able to build apps and sell them and be able to uh, offer enhanced services and discovered pretty quickly that there are people who are smarter and faster than they are at developing applications. So they sort of missed that window. So in the, in the end, I think that the service providers have to provide some enhanced services um, to, to be relevant, uh, but they have to be very careful about what is that service. And I think that, honestly, um, WebRTC will be an underpinning of the technology that they need to develop those enhanced services. But if they're not careful, they'll quickly get uh, eclipsed by other developers that are faster, smarter, and quicker. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's going to take some careful picking. I'll try to keep it fast, but I think you ask a great question in, in that um, the service providers have to ask themselves, what is their core business? Why are they doing this? They provide secure network access. They provide reliable network access, and they do a lot of interop. So if you take those three things and you focus that and say, well, how can I apply those three things to WebRTC? They're coming, I know the ones I'm working with today, they're coming up with some very creative ways of moving that forward and providing reliability, security, and interoperability. Just one last brief point on that. You really want, uh, the operators really want to enable third parties to create the great apps. You, you want to provide the back end to, to interconnect, to provide these other services that they're good at and, and let the third parties create the, create, uh, the, the additional value and, and the additional potential uh, revenue uh, for them. Uh, I, 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 actually, Jeff, I mean, I'll, I'll Oh, I'm moderating. The, the, I, I do advise telcos on how to protect future voice revenues. And there's three things to invest in. One is lawyers and lobbyists, <laughs> hugely, hugely good ROI. Another is flexible billing and charging and rating systems. Um, and actually, you mentioned the US carriers have done a good job from a telco point of view of how they've structured their, their plans to protect against some of the, um, the revenue declines that are pretty much inevitable to see elsewhere. Well, the third one is on the marketing. Uh, it amazes me that almost nowhere do I see marketing campaigns from service providers saying, make more phone calls, it's good. Yeah. And so the problem is that we not only have more supply of telephony from virtual operators and Skype and now WebRTC, but we have, in some markets, declining demand. And you don't have to be a Nobel economist to know that increasing, you know, increasing supply and decreasing demand is going to look ugly. So, you know, how about some marketing for saying, use more phone calls? <laughs> yeah, so I've heard a lot about um, what carriers are good at, interop and um, security and so forth. They're also good at charging, right? And for every one of those services, they charge you for. And while SIP may be good for carriers because it's sort of blocks in their legacy systems, isn't the advantage of WebRTC, WebRTC really a, 
a cost savings and not so much a technical driver? Well, maybe. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of a lot of the packages you get from operators are are you know they're they're package deals. I mean, there isn't necessarily incremental cost for every every uh, call you make or every uh, feature you invoke. It, it depends on the charging model, they, uh, and it's just as important for the operators to uh, to lock customers in as it is for anyone else. Uh, and uh, th therefore, it's not an easy question. It's not clear that, that WebRTC is, is if, if you use WebRTC services provided by an operator, that they're automatically going to be more expensive or, 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 or be uh, unattractive uh, compared to other alternatives. I, I just want to make that point. I, I think from the enterprise point of view, right off the bat, huge cost savings. And, and that's because they can control the environment much more than just in the public domain. But from enterprise, just think of call centers where I don't have to buy all that extra equipment. I can just use laptops, PCs, whatever's around the office and, and have a browser. And then take that to, to beyond that to education, finance. All of a sudden, that cost comes way down for those end devices. So that makes sense. Now, as far as the general public, it's a different matter. Your example about the call center is a very good example, but uh, and I, I think even that uh, you you can do it, you can do call centers not with WebRTC without telephony at all. You know you don't even to, you, you don't even need to have SIP to do that now. So that gives, uh, to my mind, the kind of superpowers to the web developers. Yeah, I would just add one quick point though. Remember a big piece of what makes a call center valuable is not necessarily connecting two people together. It's the engine of routing calls and knowing who's the right person, when are they available, scheduling people, you know, the process of, of passing calls from one to another. And that's one thing, matter of fact, a lot of the demonstrations, while I love the technology of the demonstrations, a lot of the folks really missed is that the core of a contact center is resume routing and skills routing and those kinds of things that, that uh, get the right person on the call at the right time. So uh, keep that in mind as you're putting your apps together. Yeah. Right, and, and, and that's service creation. You know, when you, when you talk about it at its core and you talk about cost, especially in a contact center, service creation is a very broad spectrum, right? So, you, you know, the, the, the idea that the being able to create that, that unique feature or function that reduces my customer's effort, and it also reduces my effort at the same time. So my cost savings, while service creation is quicker, it can create better applications or better use cases for my customers, reduce my time, reduce the, their time, everybody wins. Marketing budgets come down, it's, it's a, it's a, it feeds on itself, sort of. It's, it's so. almost like it's, it's, the, it's the protocols and concept, uh, or protocols and signaling mechanisms which allow you to signal purpose and context and intent. As right. well as not just sort of who's calling or even how they want to connect, it's why they're doing something. And that was one of the bits of value that WebRTC brings to this. And you know, then to some extent, the actual connectivity part of it is, is, is the, next, the next level down. Right, because in, in contact centers, we're aware of telephony context. Well, telephony context can be very, very small. Annie Dinas. Maybe if you, you drive somebody through a, an IVR, you can harvest a little bit more information, but now you've increased effort, so now you're reducing your loyalty through that. But web context, on the other hand, I mean, we saw some demos yesterday that were fascinating, so really tremendous. Well, listen, we, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate you all participating, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's give these guys a hand.